Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first, the first installment of our senior thesis reading. Um, we're going to have five readers today, starting with James Ciano, then Molly Curry, Katie DeLuca, Bridget Feely, and finally, Chanel Palacios. Please remember as well that we're having another reading for our other five thesis readers on Thursday. Um, same time, same place. And uh, this is, you know, this is a great event. It's one of the sort of the highlights of our calendar when our students get to showcase the work that they've been working on, not just this semester, but really in, in the four years that they've been studying with us through the major. Um, so please make sure your cell phones and everything are turned off. And please welcome our first reader, James Ciano, who will be reading poems. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, it's been a good journey the past four years, and it's nice to be able to share the end of it with you. Um, the, uh, the, my thesis that I've been working on for the past semester is titled Yard Work. Um, a lot of the poems focus around uh, kind of work I did um, as a child uh, in the yard with uh, my father and my brothers. Um, there's an epigraph to the collection from a Tom Waits song, um, and it is, Oh, the worms eat away, but don't worry, watch the wind. Um, this first poem comes out of a, uh, there's a park uh, in my town called Stillwell Park and it has a ton of soccer fields and baseball fields and it has a uh, bunch of bike trails and uh, um, the railroad that runs through my town runs right through the back of there and it's kind of where all the de degenerates go to hang out and, um, after, after high school. So this poem's called Railroad Talk and it, um, it analyzes kind of uh, uh, these kind of mythical, folkish figures from my own life, uh, as well as mythical, folkish uh, figures from the history of, of uh, the railroads in, in the States. Railroad talk. I can feel the train in my shoes before it freights down the track. It bangs its gambling fists against the earth, shakes the warblers from their trees back here in the bike trails behind Stillwell Park where a friend I've since lost came to smoke weed and toss rocks at his parents' divorce. As boys, we played trains together, laid track and built tunnels out of shoeboxes. In that song, Lead Belly plucks the tail of John Henry from his strings of catgut. This man who drove steel into the Appalachians, dug deeper into rock to find light seeping out the other side. This spike driver man, he died with a hammer in his hand, Lord, Lord, but this is folklore. Myth laced into the woods of West Virginia. In these woods, I sit by the tracks with a can of spray paint and a bottle of whiskey. When I yell into one end of a tunnel, a whisper falls out of the other. Casey Jones knew only one volume on the Cannonball Express. Drive wheel jumping the joints, barreling into the blackness of night highballing out of Memphis, whistle wailing like a whippoorwill. I'm lost back in that locomotive set that used to run on its own through the garage of my grandfather's house. And that one picture of the uncle I never met, the conductor with his mustache head hung out the window, looking for the part of himself he left behind after cracking open too many beers on the bottle opener of the liver. Maybe it's his ghost driving this train out here, this one rattling its skeleton of steel rails and tracks. It grabs hold of these bones and shakes them like the blues. Maybe my old friends on this one too, riding the passenger car as far as it will take him. I want to tell them, stop, that I am coming, that I just need to pack up my bags. Um, so this, this next poem, um, is the, uh, the title piece from the collection. Um, um, and uh, we have this awful fence in my backyard that just falls apart every, every year, and we always need to, to, to replace the boards on it. And um, that, that's what this poem talks about. It's called Yard Work. We fixed the rotted fence in the backyard. 
replaced the pieces of wood weathered by rain and families of carpenter bees. We went to work with the back ends of hammers and the dry skin of our hands, hinging and unhinging planks from their posts. I stirred paint with an oak branch, and you set up the horses over a patch of dead grass. You talked about the shortness of life and how to take care of a lawn. I took a sip of water. It fell through me like a ball through a webless mitt. I grabbed the rusted saw from out of the shed and watched the clouds peel away. The paint was red and tarnished, not like the color of blood, but like something that stopped believing in itself. The sunlight glistened off the sweat of our skin and soaked in the mouth of the saw. I held that heavy tool, flimsy and corroded with its corrugated handle. I could feel your eyes on me. They were empty as doubt. I lined up the teeth with the grain of the board and began. Uh, a few years ago, I was, I was in New York. Uh, it was a really warm May afternoon, and um, I watched a, a man bathe himself in a fountain. Um, and I had carried that image around with me for a really long time, and it never really found its way into a, a poem until now. Um, so uh, this one's called It Sounds Just Like Weeping. What happens if I drop the whole piggy bank into the fountain? Inside its stomach are years worth of pennies, earned by bagging up piles of old leaves and burnt grass. Last time I was home, you were ripping out bushes with your bare hands. I came outside to help you. We went to work together, picking apart the life by its roots. In the fountain, a man's bathing himself for the first time in years. He's more beard than body, frail and prophetic. The children splash in their sneakers and school shirts. Under the fountain's pool of public water, one of them steps on a poor fellow's wish for a girlfriend. In the park, I pick apart an oxide daisy. She loves me, she loves me not. In the garden, the wind lays all the flowers down to rest, tired flowers bending back all day towards the light. They're beginning to unbutton their petals, taking off this winter like a jacket. Under the arch, someone's trying to drink his way out the other end of a bottle. If I could snap this arch in half, I would do it like a wishbone. The rain falls from over our heads, and it sounds just like weeping, each drops as small as an argument, as small as yes or no. Um, I, had a, I had a traumatizing childhood experience where I um, I was sent downstairs to get a gallon of milk from out of our refrigerator in our basement, and I tripped up the stairs and then uh, fell back down, and the gallon of milk shattered, and I was just like laying in a pool of of milk at the foot of our stairs. <laughs> so that's that's uh, was the the starting image for this poem. What's left of the gallon of milk? The moon is spilt milk on the counter of the night. It's the gallon I dropped as a child, tripping up the basement stairs, then falling back down into the darkness at the foot. While falling, I saw the punch stains on the wall from the last cup of anything I ever filled to the top. At the bottom sits the armoire where we lost my brother's girlfriend's cat. And from the top hook of its mirror hangs the coonskin cap I used to wear as a boy in our yard, holding a stick like a rifle. The stars tonight are bullet holes on the paper of the BB gun carnival game, where that night, in an empty lot, I kissed her without knowing how. None of the, none of the stars are bullseyes, but they're all really close. Unlike the darts I tried to toss after drinking Jameson for the first time with my brothers, leaving holes in the wood of the wall and vomiting in the slop sink under the stairs next to the boxed up Christmas lights and old wiffle ball bats. And when dad watched baseball, we knew not to talk only to listen to the crack of the ball off the lumber. It sounded just like my brother's heavy feet against the wooden basement stairs. Tonight, I stare at the sky. The stars are crumbs on the moldy counter of our kitchen, the counter I climbed up on as a child eating cookies out of a jar. The moon is spilt milk, and I stay there a while. I even remember to take off my shoes. This is the last poem. Um, and it's, it's the last poem of the, uh, the thesis as a whole. It's called In the Morning After Rain. I'm opening these arms like windows, 
I'm trying to let in more light. The birds gather on an oak branch and argue awake the sun. With each yawn, it rises further into the sky. I pour coffee into the ground and watch the grass come alive. Like gutters, I am clogged after an evening of rain. In the morning, I climb a ladder to clean out leaves and fistfuls of grief. When I blow apart the dandelion, I grow back ten more. Such power in the voice in the body. Thank you. Next up is Molly Curry. Big round of applause for Molly. Woo, woo. Hi, I'm Molly, and I wrote a poetry thesis this semester with Professor Barry. Um, I'm going to start with a poem that my thesis was titled after. Smokey's Greater Shows. The tattooed man with whiskers grins as he lets a twirl of gray smoke plume out from his nostrils like the slimy tongue of a snake. It mixes with the nighttime balm of July and the smells of cotton candy, fried dough, and corn dogs with relish. A woman sm swallows a stick of fire in front of a seedy crowd of fairgoers, sneaking sips of cheap whiskey from flasks. Technicolor lights flash on spinning structures with many moving parts. The weightless bodies of children whip and spin like rag dolls. Their legs dangle from giant swings as if their limbs are boneless. A portly man can't fit the belt around the thick of his middle. They make him put down his french fries for the ride. People stop to stare at their contorted reflections in the funhouse mirror, where children run about a wheel like giant hamsters. And tomorrow, balls of cotton candy will float across the vacant lot like tumbleweed. And truck beds filled with lights and parts will pull away the fare in nuts and bolts. Um, this next poem is about my own personal experience at Sleepaway Camp. Um, <laughs> the narrative moves between the present moment and a letter being written home, so it switches between second and first person. Nights at Summer Camp. A moth hits the fan. No one stirs. The bunk bed creaks as the girl above you rolls over in her sleep. Dear Mom and Dad, a loon calls across the echoing lake. Mosquitoes. Camp is not for me. <laughs> Legs itch, arms itch. You've been attacked by savages. Please pick me up as soon as you get this letter. You swat a fly. It swarms above your head. Today I treaded water for two minutes. Two minutes too long. Arms and legs ache. I hate the food. A snoring symphony begins. First sopranos and altos. Soon the bellowing baritone joins in. And they make us sing. Fireside jingles ring in your head, sticky skin. You toss your sheets, it's hot. Your hair smells like smoke. The cabin smells like moldy wood. I had to bathe in the lake. Insects drone. Another loon returns the call. I don't think I like camp. A spring pokes your back. Your flashlight falls, you pick it up. Maybe next year. You swat a fly, spray the deep, heavy eyes. You dread the sound of the country song that is your cabin's morning alarm. Sunrise peaks in the window. Love your homesick daughter. The reveille horn sounds. Girls stir in their bunks, half asleep. They cover their ears with pillows. P.S. Save me. The country song. <laughs> <clears throat> Block Island. All night the tall grasses drone under the spell of August as the sleepless cicadas beat their furious wings and under linen sheets we toss and turn. The stairs up to the widow's watch groan quietly in the near stillness. The sound of the flag thrashing about its pole is like the pulsing wings of a hundred moths. In the window, the air that passes through the blade of the fan smells like the oil-paved roads and wild, honey wild honeysuckles. And all the while, the grass continues to whir. All day and all night it hums, a procession of muses, drunk on the essence of wild berries and sweet-smelling blossoms lurking. How careful they are to remain unseen. Okay, okay this last poem was the final one to be added to my collection. Um, it's a little different than the others, so I'll tell you a bit about my process. 
Um, after a class discussion in Professor Papoulis's class about the book Generation Me, I was compelled to do some research on my own generation. Um, so I Google searched the millennials, and I was, I thought it was amusing how many conflicting generalizations I found on the web. Um, so I compiled a list of stereotypes and alphabetized it. And from that list, I created this poem. <coughs> millennials. We are attention-craving, achievement-oriented, activists, and atheists, not to mention we're also ambitious. We balance work and life on a BlackBerry device. We want change we can believe in. We're confident, con conventional collaborators and communicators who challenge tradition. We are digital revolutionaries who value diversity. We are educated, entitled, eco-boomers seeking equal rights, but we're extrinsic in our values. We are emailers, Facebookers. We're family-centric, funny, and fun. We want freedom of choice while we seek fame and fortune. We Facebook, Gmail, and Google. We're humorous. We have high hopes. We are impatient. We want instant gratification. We are iPhone, iHome, iPod, iPad, iCloud users, and Instagrammers. <laughs> we want jobs, but we're kids. Lazy, liberal, materialistic multitaskers trying to make money, money, money. We watch movies on Netflix, and we're all a bunch of narcissists. But we're also open-minded and opportunistic. We're political, pressured, pierced from head to toe, tuned into pop culture. We're quirky, rebellious, receptive to new ideas. We're special, sheltered, self-righteous, self-expressive, stressed out, social networking socialites. Some tech savvies, other, others tech dependent, and we're all team oriented. On Twitter, we tweet and they call us upbeat. We hold values, less virtues. We play world, words with friends, we use the world wide web. We're not wallflowers, we're world changers. We take Xanax and Xyloshield. We succeed Gen X, we are Gen Y, with zip cars and Zell. <laughs> Kate DeLuca. Hi, I'm Kate. Um, okay, so my poetry thesis, I've been working with Professor Rossini this whole time, and she's amazing. Where is she? She's amazing. Hi. Um, and my title of the thesis is called The Fainted Orchid. Um, it was just an image that came up a lot, and I did some research on orchids um, the other night, actually, and I found out that they're like the strongest flower, and just because they're, they're weak at times doesn't mean that they're not going to thrive and live. But um, my thesis is broken up into two sections. One is Paris, and the other is New York, where I'm from. I studied abroad in Paris my junior year. So the first two poems are going to be from Paris, and the next are going to be from New York. Um, there's a lot of focus on a relationship. It's not necessarily the same one, but there's a speaker and a you throughout each poem, and that's, that's where I started with this one. So the first poem I'm going to read is called The Year You Grew a Mustache. Then we sat cross-legged on the edge of the Seine, where boats passed, passers-by strolled. We thought little about who they were or what they meant to the world. We passed a bottle of Sincere back and forth, the buttery oak flavor lasting longer than we would. Soon, the moment drifted to memory. I thought of you while I sat at the back of the plane, my legs scrunched towards the tray table. I remembered watching your mouth as you spoke and smoked, the feathery ash landing on the cement floor. Three buttons of your shirt were undone, just enough to see beads of sweat collecting on the tip of your chest hair. Your voice rasps from too many cigarette packs and your smile, crooked with unease. In your hands was a no-name guitar, dented and bruised, stained from hazy nights in Montmartre. There was dirt caked beneath your tough finger beds. You rarely looked up, yet you prayed as a wolf, tail perched, hiding behind crimson bushweed. The next Sorry, I have to scroll through the words. Um, this is a poem. It's kind of a little bit about my grandpa. He was um, in World War II, but um, 
it, I, I made it take place in Paris and like I envisioned my, this didn't actually happen, I just envisioned myself looking at an old man in the back of the cafe. So this one's called To the Old Man Sitting in the Back of the Cafe. <laughs> There's something happening here between the yellow pages of Basho's haikus that range from winter to spring and the wine stains on the Persian rug. Somewhere a rooster banters and the old man who sits wasting can't even hear it. He's distracted by memories, thinking about the war. Italy, France, Africa, that hut he built in Sardinia out of sweat and cinder blocks for him and his troops to live in. Between the bombs, he'd light cigarettes. The scratched walls and the cellars, left by skeletal animals, imprinted in his mind, even now, as he sits in his chair, thinking of his dead wife and the letters he wrote to her every day when he was 16 the letters he writes to her, even now. Um, the next poem is the starting off poem for my section two, which is in New York. And um, we had been reading a lot of C.K. Williams in Professor Barry's class. So the ending image is something that I wrote an essay about. It's a, it's a dog taking a piss, or not actually a piss, but it's a little more graphic than that, but <laughs> the, this one is, um, I was sitting in this restaurant in Brooklyn, it's called Zaytoons, and you can literally order things for like five dollars and get this just huge plate, so this is me like sitting in a restaurant. <laughs> it's called Zaytoons. There's a place off Myrtle where you can eat dishes shipped from the Middle East for five dollars a plate and sip on hookah if you're nice to the owner, whose Turkish accent makes your ears squint as you try to listen to the specials. Kebabs and halal over pita and hummus, a dust-colored lampshade with a brass base, and half-forgotten moons in the pale evening light. The moons sit on top of Fort Green, a few blocks down, above the table you eat at alone, decorated in handcrafted sapphire and gold-stained glass by fingers that believed in a different kind of afterlife than you did then as you stared at the stray dog pissing in front of the dust-covered window his ears pointed downwards towards the stale ground of late March, his hazel eyes widening as he looks for his owner, waiting to be scolded and smacked. Um, the next poem is a bit longer. It's an elegy about a, an old lover who actually committed suicide, and I wasn't able to write about that for a while, but I figured I could write about it if I told events that didn't actually happen, but just kept like sort of the feelings and tones that I was feeling at that moment of difficulty for me. So this is called an elegy in two parts. Part one, the drive to Georgia was smooth for the first 300 miles, but then mayhem. My hair started to fall piece by piece out of the scrunchie. Sooner or later, it was all down. Black curls echoing the spirals of wind sucked in through the windows. The hours scudded by even slower than it took for you to eat that orange. You couldn't dig your index nail deep enough into the tangy skin for it to break until four or five times later when the citric mist overpowered the scent of our bottleneck cigarettes. I wanted to burn the sleeves of your shirt with my lime green lighter, but couldn't, wouldn't, so I turned the radio up instead. Your legs were propped on the dashboard, ripped jeans covered in black and blue ink, scribbled words from the time you took too much acid and couldn't stop drawing. I remember how still they were then, the words on your legs, your skeletal knee jutting out through the fabric above the orange peels on the floor. That dress I wore to your funeral dangles now from a hanger in my closet, laced embroidering and ruffled sleeves, a boat neck to show just enough collarbone and seams that end just at the knee. Part two. I think of your shirt I stole after that downpour, your pruned hands rubbing the sides of my arms as if that would warm me. It was late September, near your birthday, when I heard you were selling your car, the one we spent hours in nightly that summer. Smoke seeped from the, from the lavender incense you had on the console, and Ray Charles' smooth rasp soothed the silence that stood between us. I think of how slow you'd drive down my pebbled driveway, careful so the dog wouldn't bark. 
There, I'd sit for 10 minutes or more, your passenger, eyes scrolling to the orange peels on the dashboard. Later, we switched Charles for Chopin, only to wonder how his fingers trickled so fast down those keys, like the way the still rain sitting on the tops of leaves fell after the wind blew onto your windshield. I asked you why an orchid withers, even though we love it. Some things you couldn't answer, like why you chewed your nails, or why we can never stop loving the dead. I kept your shirt because New York gets cold in the fall, especially after it rains. And one more, um, this is a more fun one. I was watching um, the Kurt Cobain documentary on Netflix. It's like a BBC thing and it's basically Everybody just blaming Courtney Love for his suicide. I don't know. But so I was watching that and I was thinking I took classes in Columbia this summer and I was just thinking about like all those subway rides. So this is inspired by that. It's called Who Killed Kurt? It takes a gypsy skirt and homegrown raspberries, a 10 euro carton of cigarettes from Bali and 16 minutes on the subway to hear last night's forgetful tune. Played in the room above the smashed pumpkins where graffiti decorates concrete walls, ruined chalk against a late night canvas. It's where we go to taste stale air and wait for blown out eardrums to die slow and eyes to shine like those last lines of cocaine. You wonder how Cobain went under stolen sunglasses with thick rims built to hide the gray shadows below tired eyes. In sync with the underground, your pupils rumble, disheveled by routine. Let's not forget the Romanian boy across from you, who steals the gold off withered fingertips, forgetting that gunshot and the trouble of last night, forgetting the dust's easy moon as he shakes and shakes his tambourine. And Bridget Feely is up next. Hey, I'm Bridget. Um, my thesis is titled uh, Tree of Heaven, and I've been working with Kieran Berry. Um, my first poem is kind of how I feel about applying for jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so, early morning. Before the plum of dawn skulks over the horizon, painting the sky in pastels like macaroons, I watch the cool cobalt of early morning or late night splintered by the panting of engines. There are doves cooing mellow caws into the wind, they rustle through each stripped branch that will soon birth petite buds that will blossom into flowers the color of fresh berries. I see the clouds part, the car's tire, tires squeal, their persistent whine and exhaust fumes curl into deep, tarnished, silvery slivers as the commuters rumble underneath my window. And it is here, leaning against the bone white wood, that I realize where I am not going. Okay, the second is to um, an old friend who I've kind of lost touch with. It's called To a Stranger. The last time I saw you, you spoke about dissecting cats. Your face, pallid, looked absolved of worry, and there were blue veins twisting up your throat, translucent beneath the pastel, whitewashed light, leaving trails of smoke signals on your skin. We talked about the leaves, how they changed from emerald and olive, breaking under my boots, and the air that felt thinner as you inhaled, blowing your nose with a little blood. Now I could no longer stay awake to see the moon. I watched you, limp, a rag doll, your eggshell flesh like wax paper, delicate and crinkling under the weight of your homemade quilt. Hair the color of straw fell around your cerulean shell eyes, each an empty well, staring at the dark sky. And I could see your bones poking from underneath that sweater. Um, my next poem is about my mom. Um, and we <laughs> used to go to this park um, almost every day when I was little. And my older brother was at school, and this is like kind of a weird special memory that I have and it's titled after the name of my thesis which is Tree of Heaven. Little bee, my little bee, the honey of my hive, you'd coo while I sat wrapped in grandmom's afghan, tenderly waiting for your soft hands to sweetly envelop my own. This was back when I was still small enough to use the stool at the bathroom sink. When the sun was just right, we'd walk down the street coated in dandelions, like dandelion my favorite book, to the park where we'd swing high as the moon, and you'd take the leaves that had fallen from the Tree of Heaven awaiting its crisp winter coat, shedding those tiny helicopters encrusted with pollen, teetering in the breeze. 
I can still remember watching you peel apart the thick outer shell to where the stickiness hid and placing it on the bridge of my teacup nose. And we'd laugh until I'd hiccup. That was then. And my last poem is um, called Coming to Connecticut in January. And it's actually a line that I heard in Professor Popolis's class um, that was written by somebody else. Um, and it's called Coming to Connecticut in January. The earth is caked in a layer of grime, while the once pallid snow is ash under each passing foot. Children, bundled up like nesting dolls, walk by brick buildings, their little limbs tangled and twisted beneath dense winter coats. They open their mouths, laughing with a sound like popping popcorn, each miniature pout the color of raspberries, and exhales sneaking breath into frosted hands. Maybe they shouldn't breathe in, as the air is thick with smog from car heaters, but the smell of pines still loiters nearby. And when everything seems dull and muted, or when beauty seems hidden behind massive trees undressed of their leaves, I see a sky that is almost indigo, and I know. It will be dusted with peach or lavender soon, then things will seem brighter, all right. I think the darkness doesn't always outweigh the light. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm not poetry, I'm fiction. Um, only one, so I feel like I can do whatever I want up here. Um, yeah, I don't really have a good explanation for my process, really just someone says something that bothers me and I write a story about it. <laughs> All right, uh, this is called, <laughs> this is called Routine. Mr. Sanchez told his daughter, Mari, that he would disown her if she brought home a black man. Coincidentally, Mari found herself attracted to black men more and more. She did not prefer one shade over another, but the lighter the skin color, the quicker her interest faded. The family was having a get-together to celebrate the death anniversary of a person who only the oldest aunts and uncles remembered. However, their children were respectful enough to partake in all the traditions. The get-togethers generally had a routine. There was a carne asada with one uncle cooking the meat, his wife making the beans, and another aunt bringing her special rice. Their children and other nieces and nephews made the salsa, brought the, trip, the chips and the drinks and the dip and other small things. Mari brought her new boyfriend, Derek. Mari introduced Derek to Mrs. Sanchez first in the hopes that her mother would develop her own opinion. Mrs. Sanchez claimed to be, the more progress to be more progressive than her other half. Hello, Mom, this is Derek, she said. It's great to me meet you, Mrs. Sanchez, he said, holding his hand out. Mrs. Sanchez hesitated. Mrs. Sanchez knew that her husband knew nothing of this man because she would have heard about it. She would have heard about it in very high volumes. Hello, Derek, Mrs. Sanchez said as she shook his hand. How long have you been friends with our Mari? Mari brought friends over all the time. This was no different, Mrs. Sanchez told herself. And Derek assumed that Mrs. Sanchez addressed each of her daughter's dates as friends. He was about to respond when Mari answered for him. He's my boyfriend, Mom, Mari said. She watched her mother hold her breath for half a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, you've never mentioned him before, Mrs. Sanchez said. I did tell you about him, Mother. You just pictured someone else, Mari said. She led Derek away before anyone could say anything more. When Mari ended the conversation with that comment and led him away, Derek understood, but he was not alarmed. He felt that he could slightly identify with Mari's family. After all, he was not a white man entering the home looking for a gardener or a cleaning lady. Mm -hmm. Mari took Derek around the house and through the yard, introducing him to her aunt, then her uncle, and then a cousin, and then another set of aunts and uncles. Derek couldn't remember all of their names, but Mari had told him to just address them as either senora or senor, if he forgot. She told him that everyone spoke enough English to carry on small talk, and if he wanted to go into deeper conversations, then he should find her older brothers, or her cousins, or her parents, or her aunt, or an uncle. You still haven't introduced me to your father, he said. Oh, that's right, Mari said. Let me look for him. Just wait here. Mari left him in the middle of the yard, and he wasn't sure who to start a conversation with. He couldn't stand by himself for too long, though, lest he be considered rude. So he went up to a cousin who was sitting with his mother and father. Orlando, right? Derek said. Orlando looked up at Derek. Yeah, man, here, let me pull up a chair for you, he said to Derek as he stood up. Derek would have grabbed one for himself, but he needed the invitation to the table. Orlando came back quickly with a chair and placed it right between his mother and himself. The mother turned to Derek. ¿Cómo te llamas? she asked. Derek had already been introduced to her, but since he could not remember her name either, he went along again. Derek, he said, how are you, he asked. He figured he had better admit to not knowing Spanish right away. 
I'm Mijo, I'm so sorry, she said. I'm Tita. She said something to the others at the table, and they resumed their conversations again, but in English. Oh, they don't have to do that, Derek said. Tita responded, nonsense, that would be rude. For all you know, they would have been talking about you. She laughed, and then Orlando snorted. Yeah, other than the grandparents, everyone here speaks English, she said. So be worried if you hear Spanish from anyone else. Derek laughed. Thank you. That's actually good to know. Of course, said Tita. Derek spoke with the table for a few minutes while he waited for Mari. They asked him the same questions they asked of any man Mari brought home. He told them he was in the army, he was 28 years old, and he met Mari through mutual friends. There wasn't much else to be said. Everyone at the table was friendly, and Derek began to relax. Mari must have sensed this because just then she came through the door to the yard with her father and waved Derek over. Derek excused himself and walked over to Mr. Sanchez. Mrs. Sanchez hustled through the kitchen to join them. Dad, this is Derek, Mari said. Derek, this is my father, Robert Sanchez. It's great to meet you, sir, he said. He held his hand out for the 30th time that afternoon, but this was the first time it hadn't been met with a handshake. After several moments, Derek put his hand away and looked towards Orlando and Tita. They were watching Mr. Sanchez. Mari turned to give her father a look as well. Hello, Mr. Sanchez says, and then he walked away. Mari shook her head and then took, de took Derek to follow her over to the table with her siblings, her parents, and her grandparents from her father's side. Derek hesitated to meet the grandparents in case they were anything like her father. Mari's grandparents looked at Derek without blinking for a long time, but finally said hello. Then they began speaking in Spanish to each other, but Derek remembered Orlando's words. But then he heard Mari's parents speaking in Spanish, and so he leaned towards Mari. Mari, he whispered, what are they talking about? She stopped talking with her brothers and looked up towards her parents. They're just talking about their jobs, she said loudly. Mr. Sanchez continued speaking in Spanish while his own parents turned towards Derek. Your name? The grandmother asked. Derek, senora, he said. The grandmother nodded and spoke to her husband. Grandpa, speak English, Mari shouted at her grandfather. Derek turned to her. No, 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 it's okay, I'm fine, he said. And so Mari smiled at him. Don't worry, I do this with him all the time. The grandfather gave Mari a big smile, highlighting his missing front teeth. No, no, not today, he said. His accent made his words sound harsh. Well, how about tomorrow, Mari asked him. No, no, not tomorrow, Friday, Friday, he said. Mari laughed. Grandpa, tomorrow is Friday, she said. Okay, okay, I speak English now, he said. Mari giggled while her grandfather nodded and smiled at her. Her grandfather turned to Derek and said, Be good, she's precious. Derek smiled. Si, senor, he said. Mari laughed loudly. Grandpa, you make me blush, she shouted, but her grandfather did not understand her words. Instead, he saw her cheeks go pink and his smile widened enough to show at least six silver crowns. He closed his mouth before Derek could confirm the number. Mari's brother smiled along at the interaction, having been used to their sister and grandfather teasing each other. She was the first granddaughter, and she was indeed precious to them. Mari's brothers were discussing, in English, their girlfriends, while Mr. and Mrs. Sanchez continued speaking in Spanish. Mari turned and spoke to her mother. Mom, she said, how come Tia Elena didn't make it? I wanted to introduce her to Derek. But Mari did not actually care why her Tia was not there. No se sentía bien, Mrs. Sanchez said. Mom, could you please speak English so that Derek can understand, Mari said. Derek began to object, but Mr. Sanchez got to it first. I will not have your mother repress her own culture for a stranger, he said to Mari. <laughs> Mari maintained eye contact with her father while tilting her head towards her right shoulder. She did not roll her eyes at her parents anymore. She was now 25. Instead, she pushed her bottom jaw out. This isn't the Spanish conquest, father, she said. Even your parents are making more of an effort. I will not cater to his ignorance, he said. Mari turned away from her father. The two of them shared many traits. When each felt that there was no hope in arguing, they turned away from the other. Mari turned to her mother. Well, mother, she asked. Ya de hello, her mom said. Por favor. Mari nodded to her mother and then told Derek that it was time to go home. Mrs. Sanchez then nodded to herself, knowing that Mari would not say goodbye to her. Derek went around the yard and the house saying goodbye to everyone else, saving her grandparents for last. Mari's grandfather shook Derek's hand and said, Goodbye, good guy. <laughs> Mari's grandmother gave both Mari and Derek kisses on the cheek. Mari and Derek left the house right after. And that's all I'm reading today. Um, yeah. Don't, don't know how to end. I'm going to avoid it. <laughs>